Thank you for joining us for our second session of the day. My name is David Apple. I'm the head of the software and SaaS vertical at Intac, which is the world's largest independent pure cloud ERP firm. And we've got a great session for this one. This one's all about after Marketo, what I would do the second time. This is going to be moderated by Doug Pepper. Doug is the managing director at Shasta Ventures, longtime BC, some great companies. Just two of them include Optimizely and uh, Flurry, which was acquired by Yahoo several years ago. And then John Miller, who is co-founder of Marketo, and this is his second firm, Engageo. As we were prepping, it reminded me of a story some of you guys might have heard. Sir Richard Branson wrote letters to himself, his 10-year-old self, his 20-year-old self, his 30-year-old self. What we get the benefit of is John essentially writing a letter to himself about what he would do 10 years ago that everybody in this room can apply to how you build a great business. Big fan of Engageo, uh, a lot of Shasta Ventures companies on Intact, and with that, I'm gonna introduce Doug, and he's gonna introduce John. Appreciate it, appreciate it. Hey everybody, uh, thanks for the intro, David. It's great to be here. Uh, as he said, my name's Doug Pepper. Uh, I am a managing director at Shasta Ventures. Uh, we are an early stage venture capital firm. We look for category creating companies, both in enterprise and consumer. Uh, it's a great honor to be on stage here with my friend, John Miller. Uh, we actually go way back. We were in business school together in 1999, uh, but I had the real pleasure of investing in John uh, when he was the founding CMO of Marketo back in 2006 uh, with his partners Phil Fernandez and Dave Morandi. Uh, John won't brag about himself, but he is a very unique marketer. All at the same time, he is strategic, he's quantitative, and he's creative. And he really helped pioneer the use of content marketing and B2B marketing. But more than that, what I think is so special about John is that he doesn't just market a specific product or even a company. Uh, what John does is he focuses on defining and creating categories and then building the leading company within that category. Obviously at Marketo, he was very successful in doing that, uh, building the company from the ground up, helping establish the marketing automation category. Ultimately, they took the company public in 2013 and then sold it last year for $1.8 billion. And now he's doing it again. He's doing it again with Engageo in the account-based marketing space. He's helping to establish that category and then ultimately building a leading company there. But this time he's doing it as a second time founder. And I just think it's an amazing opportunity for all of us uh, to have him share with us what he's learned over those many year years of success and how he's applying those learnings to doing things even better the second time around in Gageo. So John, this is really the John show. Uh, he's going to do a 20 minute presentation, as you'll see, and then we'll sit down and do about 10 minutes of sort of fireside chat Q&A. So John, thanks for being here and take it away. Thank you, thank you for the kind words. <clears throat> All right, so as you heard, I was one of the co-founders of Marketo. Apparently somebody told me the other day that I'll know I've actually made it with Engageo when I no longer need to be introduced as the co-founder of Marketo first. <laughs> uh, but I have been in marketing technology my whole career. I am a marketing technologist, but I'm more than that, I'm also a father. Uh, these are my two kids. The, the fun fact is that my son, who's obviously the older of the two here, he was actually born the exact same month that we incorporated Marketo, which has made it really easy for me to keep track all these years of how old Marketo is. Uh, they both turned 12 this month, in case you're, or 11 this month, in case you're, you're following. <laughs> Another fun fact is that I was actually born here in uh, Ethiopia, or you know, what's marked here as Eritrea. And when people hear this fact that I was born in Ethiopia, uh, I often get the exact same question, which is, hey John, why were you born in Ethiopia? I always give the same answer, which is that I wanted to be close to my parents. That has nothing to do with marketing technology or SaaS or entrepreneurship. Of a little bit more relevance, and Doug alluded to this, is the fact that I studied physics for my undergraduate degree. I actually spent my summers doing fusion research at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, got into MIT for a PhD program. Uh, but I wanted to give this whole business world a try. Uh, I deferred uh, MIT to go into management consulting and then very quickly into marketing technology from there. Uh, and I haven't looked back. 23 years later, but I don't regret the fact I studied physics. 
I think that quantitative analytical way of thinking has helped to guide my career both as a marketer and now as a CEO. And I think you'll see that through this presentation. So what I'm going to cover is just briefly kind of the history of my story from Marketo now to Engageo, and then hopefully cover the key things you guys came here to see, which is the 10 things I'm doing differently. Uh, and then the, I'm excited, the best part is getting the conversation with Doug. So to set up, you know, what, you know, what is this new thing that I'm doing? You know, at Marketo, we built a revenue engine where marketing was generating 80% of all the deals the sales team closed, which was you know, using content and inbound marketing techniques and then our own lead nurturing and lead scoring. And it was wildly efficient. You know, and it drove a ton of growth. But what happened was around you know, about a year before the IPO, the, the CFO, Fred Ball, came to me and said, hey, John, we want to invest more to grow even faster. You know, how much faster can we grow? And he came to me in marketing because we were driving 80% of the pipeline. And the problem that I had, or we had, was it's not like I could just write more blog posts and suddenly generate more leads. You know, I needed to find new ways to grow pipeline beyond this other thing that was working, but it was kind of you know, hitting its, its maximum. And so we identified a list of target accounts that we really wanted to get into, and we started reaching out to them proactively. And I realized that there's two different styles of go-to-market here at play. What we had been doing at Marketo was fishing with nets. You know, we didn't care which company responded. We just cared, did we get enough? You know, but this new thing we were doing is much more like fishing with spears, where we were not waiting for them to swim into our net. We were reaching out to them proactively. Uh, and that was the genesis of the idea I had for Engageo. Marketo and the other marketing automation tools are great for phishing with nets, and I started Engageo to be the platform for phishing with spears. So, you know, after the IPO, you know, Marketo stopped kind of feeling like my company. You know, like you don't leave your, your, your comp the company you founded when it's your own baby, right? But eventually it got big enough, it stopped feeling like it was mine, you know, it started to feeling just like it was a job. And then, you know, that kind of set in the motion the desire for me to, to leave and then actually go pursue this new thing. So I left in February of 2015 and then formally started the company on Pi Day, March 14th, 2015. So we're only a little under two years old now at this point. Um, but we've had an extraordinarily fast start, I'm, ex I'm very proud of. We've signed up over 100 customers and are currently at about 2.6 million of ARR, which is not a huge number compared to a lot of the other people on stage at this event. But for basically selling the product for one year, I'm very happy with that. And in order to achieve that success, we did a lot of the same things that we did at Marketo. I know this presentation is about 10 things I'm doing better, but the reality is Marketo was a success, and you know, a lot of the core things are the same. I think perhaps the most important thing that we're doing the same is we identified a great market. You know, some people give me credit for you know, creating marketing automation or creating this idea of account-based marketing. That's not true. You know, what I did is I saw something that was existing, and then I helped to define it, and then I helped to amplify it. And in so doing, yeah, a lot of the credit does go to the, my companies. But the key in both cases, when I sort of saw that there's a good opportunity for a company, was a, a, a category that had existing buyers with existing competitors, but the competition wasn't so big and so strong that we couldn't come in and ultimately you know, win by kind of executing well. And those are the markets that I like, because you don't have to do all the category creation. You can instead do this category def definition and bring that to you. So great market, number one. Number two is pretty just obvious. You have to build a good product. Thank you to my co-founder, Brian Babcock, and the rest of the team you know, for that. Uh, and you have to have great sales and marketing execution. Uh, so, you know, we are kind of, you know, eating our own dog food, or as I like to say, drinking our own champagne, uh, driving high-velocity sales deals, and growing the business. So, great product, great market, great product, great execution. Those are givens. That fancy transition there is called the vortex for any PowerPoint nerds. <laughs> so, what are the things I'm doing differently? You know, in, in, in a nutshell, you know, at Marketo, we built a great product and ultimately led to a really good outcome. But I don't believe that we built a great company. 
You know, and I think that's a really important distinction. Um, so, you know, Patrick Lencioni, I'm a, I'm a big fan of his writing and, and his work. You know, he talks about companies that are smart and companies that are healthy. And I truly believe, you know, now on my second time, that a healthy company with average smarts will beat a, uh, you know, kind of an unhealthy company, you know, sorry, a super smart company with kind of only average health. Did I get that right? I got that right. So, you know, I, so number one thing I'm trying to do different here is really focus my time, my energy on building a healthy company. So, you know, the first thing that I'm doing there, you know, I mean, there's a bunch of things, is kind of core values. And it may sound like motherhood and apple pie to define your core values, but the reality is it matters. And at Marketo, we didn't define core values until we were about $20 million of ARR. And, you know, what, what that results is, you know, effectively, we had, you know, you have a culture, you have, you know, things that evolve, but it was actually kind of balkanized with different groups and different teams having different sets of values. And that ultimately made it hard to row in one direction, you know, as a coordinated team. So, you know, and, 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 and Marketo suffered, to be honest, I think, as we got bigger. You know, because of that, you know, especially after, you know, after the IPO, in some ways, it made it hard to retain people. You know, before the IPO, there's a lot of drive towards, oh, we have this goal, this kind of everybody's excited for this particular moment in time. You know, on the other side of it, if you don't have kind of strong values and that strong culture, uh, it definitely made keeping people a little bit harder. So at, Mar at Engageo, my co-founder and I defined our core values literally before we uh, incorporated, you know, just in the very first stages you know, when we we're still talking about how we're gonna split up our founder's equity. As a sidebar, we have three couplets, as you see here. For some reason, that's a hell of a lot easier to remember than just lists of five or six values. Second thing I'm really focusing on is, as with my time, is uh, teaching, you know, my team how to be a good team and how to work, you know, effectively. Again, I'm relying on uh, Patrick Lencioni here. You know, at the core is just literally building the team, the team trust, right? Because if, you know, what, you need the trust, when that's there, then what you can have is you can actually start to have debate, and in some cases, healthy conflict. And if you don't have a team willing to call each other out and kind of push each other honestly and candidly, you know, you're going to be sub-optimizing, right? So trust, and then on top of that, the ability to have conflict, you know, from there, you need to then have clarity and commitment. So once you've all decided what you're going to do, you have to make sure it's super clear and everybody's aligned against that. And now you're all moving in the same direction. We've implemented an OKR process, uh, which is, I think, a really key element for making sure that happens. You need to make sure that your team members can work on making each other accountable. So it's not just my job as the CEO to go to somebody and say, you're not doing well enough, or you made a commitment on that OKR and you're not achieving. The whole team calls everybody out on that. And then ultimately, that works when you know, people put the company's needs before their department's needs before their own personal needs. So really trying to push that into my team and hope that they push it down to their team. Now, once you have clarity about what you're trying to do, once you have your core values, you need to then make sure that gets pushed into every operational process, you know, whether that's hiring or onboarding or even how do you do raises? You know, how do you, you know, promote people? You know, those, all those processes need to reflect the way you've decided you want, you want to run your business. And I'll be honest, that was overwhelming to me you know, when we were small. Just, you know, how am I going to put all these processes in place? as you know, a little startup with 100 other things on my mind. So one of the smartest things I think I did in the history of Engageo is I pulled together what I called a culture day. And we spent the morning talking about our core values and you know, who, you know, what stories prove, share those values. Uh, what is our shared mission? Like what, what, is, what, what meaning do we get together from working you know, here? And then what we did is we did a you know, brainstorm around our ideas around all these topics. But then to actually put that into execution, every person had to sign up their name against one of these teams. And then we held those teams accountable for actually putting these processes in place. So as a fairly small company, we were able to build fairly mature uh, processes around building a healthy company. Um, 
Now, the challenge I have is we've grown a lot since last July when we did that. We have new people, so we have to figure out a process in place for continuing to refresh that. We're going to do it again on our second year birthday uh, in March. The last thing I'm really thinking about in terms of healthy companies is, you know, fairly tactical, but how do you have a good meeting? You know, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I've been in a job, Marketo even earlier, when I fantasize about quitting, it was almost always I was in some meeting, <laughs> right, where something is just boring, you know, and there's a reason why so many people check their phones and bring their laptops to meetings. Most meetings suck, right, and so uh, we work really hard at teaching our company how to have good meetings, and the number one thing that makes a meeting good is debate. Right? When there's some conflict going, when people are like, I don't agree with you, you're wrong on this, but still based upon that trust, that's when everybody puts their phones down right? and like, starts paying attention because this is exciting. This is good. And you, know, you, you want that debate and conflict going because you're going to get a good decision on the other side. All right, a couple other thoughts on the things I'm doing differently. Uh, first of all, fundraising strategy. So in eight, less than 18 months, I raised $32 million at Engageo, which is uh, almost as much as Marketo raised in four and a half years. You know, so you would think, wow, that's amazing that you kind of you know, raised all that money. The, the problem, though, is in order to not get diluted to hell, like we, we raised that money at fairly high valuations, which is a nice thing you can do as a second time founder. But that big money, like it, eventually, I'm going to need to raise money based on real metrics. Right? Not just based on this, the fact that I'm being a second timer. And so I need to make sure that the money lasts just as long. Right? I need to get just as far in terms of ARR and growth and other operational metrics on the same amount of dollars. Right? So it's, it's not like it's any better <laughs> to have more money. It actually means you have to have the operational discipline in order to make sure you're still achieving the same, well, you know, achieving the same milestones you need for the same amount of dollars. Um, We've been pretty efficient. Actually, you know, I haven't, you know, my first raise was 10 million. We're still spending that. We actually haven't even started to touch the, the second 22 million. Um, and right now we have cash through the middle of 2019. So, you know, it's good to have lots of money, you know, but you still have to have the operational uh, efficiency. The benefits to us of this strategy are less dilution, you know, less risk, right? The world could blow up. Who knows what's going to happen? Uh, and so the fact that we do have a big bank account gives us strategic flexibility. And lastly, less distraction, right? I, I'm going to be able to go for two and a half years without thinking about fundraising. That's actually a really nice thing for driving the business. Another thing that sort of I have as a second timer is uh, a roadmap. You know, the, you know, back in the days of Marketo, you didn't know, we didn't know, like, how fast should we grow or how it, should the quota for a sales rep be or or what the gross margin <laughs> should look like. Fast forward to today, there's lots of great resources out there, Saster included, that tell us how we should grow. What should we do? And the ability to rely on that to drive our growth, like for example, mapping to the battery triple, triple, double, 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 is a really important way for us to know that we're on track. Another thing I'm doing differently is uh, in how I'm thinking about the market. This market map is something I put together to just sort of um, kind of really help to understand uh, who all the players are in my category uh, with these different kind of sub pieces to it. But, um, you know, the, the, the reality is the, in Marketo, it was a hyper competitive world, right? It was ugly at Marketo with our competition, especially with Eloqua going kind of at it, you know, if you will, both in the field, in marketing. I'm doing it very differently here. I mean, we are taking partnerships with almost every company on this map, if possible, for the goal of building the category together, um, which has been great. It's why account-based everything has taken off so quickly, because you have companies collaborating you know, around it. Uh, and frankly, it's just nicer. There's no reason to be nasty you know, out there. A little tactically, and then we'll get to the discussion. Um, you know, I am focusing on bigger deals my second time. At Marketo, we, did, we, we started kind of fairly SMB, small deals, 12K. Um, and that's a tough business. You know, the, the, you, know you, have one, you usually have one user. If they leave, you're just, there's nobody left to use the product. They churn. Uh, they take just as long to get up and running. They have more questions. There's less expertise. Um, and so 
we're really trying to focus higher. My goal is a 40K average contract value where we regularly are doing six-figure deals. We're, we're getting up there. We're currently at 26K uh, ACV, and that's just a better, healthier place to be. Um, and part of that is building our enterprise muscle earlier. Right? We're not a full enterprise company right now, but I know we want to be there. And that's a hard muscle to build you know, if you wait too late. So we're trying to build that as early as possible. And then lastly, you know, as I said earlier, we are drinking our, our own champagne on kind of driving outbound sales. Um, you know, and you know, again, like at Marketo is really hard when we try to layer that on you know, after six years of sales reps just kind of being fed inbound leads. And so trying to be balanced at the beginning with both marketing but also driving that outbound, uh, I think important muscle to build and also to make sure that you don't create a culture uh, where sales kind of forgets how to do that. So if you may notice, that was actually only nine things we're doing differently. Uh, and so I think we'll, you know, hit the, uh, the other number 10 and a few other points with the Q&A. That's great. Sound good? That's wonderful. Thanks, John. Great insights. Yeah, that's, that's great, John. Um, what I want to focus on, uh, some operational aspects, but I also want to get a little bit more personal with John and just hear a little bit more what it's like from a personal perspective as an executive being uh, not only a second-time founder, but a first-time CEO. Um, so first question, John, you know, obviously you've been very successful with Marketo. That was wonderful. And Thank you. when you were building Marketo, you hadn't had that yet. And so now that you have that success under your belt, how are your goals different at Engageo? Are you operating differently going for the bigger win or taking more yeah. risk? How are you thinking about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think that, uh, you know, I don't think the most successful entrepreneurs are ever uh, just financially driven. You know, and I, I certainly haven't been. Uh, you know, for me, most of my career has been, I think, driven by, I mean, a vision that I have of kind of pursuing the one-to-one -one future, you know, just making marketing and sales more intelligent, you know, more meaningful through through data and, and analytics, and and that you know that was true of what I was trying to do with Marketo. It was true of what I was trying to do with Epiphany before that, and it's definitely true of what I'm trying to do with Engageo. So that goal of just trying to, I want to build a, that product is is really what what drives me more than anything else. But you know, there is obviously there's some personal stuff there too. I mean, uh, I'd like to prove like I think I'm seen out there as a very good marketer. I want to prove that I'm actually a good CEO too. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, you know, could be maybe Marketo was just a fluke, right? You know, and, but I think obviously if you can do it two times uh, as a success, then that, that's a line as opposed to a data point. Um, and in terms of the financial stuff, I mean, I don't want to sound snobby about it, but like, yeah, I mean, once you've had some success, you know, a, a few million dollars isn't, doesn't make a difference. And so just as you can see in our fundraising strategy, you know, I have priced ourselves out of any kind of quick flip. And so almost by definition, we're going for something big. Mm -hmm. And for you as second time founder that's been very successful, is there any increase in pressure because you've been successful? Are there higher expectations? Do people expect you to know everything? Yeah. Does it feel ever like there's a greater weight on your shoulders? Yeah. I mean, it's way better to be second time than not. I mean, let's just you know, be kind of clear. You know, it's, it's great for fundraising. It's great for building our market presence and awareness. Um, uh, so I don't get a ton of pressure externally, but I do, I get a little bit from, you know, from myself, you know, and, and partly, you know, there is that kind of, you know, oh gosh, what if this thing doesn't work out? You know, the, you know, the, the fear of failure, you know, particularly because now having, I mean, it's a drug, you, you get addicted to it, you know, like if this thing doesn't work out and then like, well, I got to just go become CMO at some company after this, like that's going to kind of suck. Um, <laughs> You know, so there is kind of that right. personal thing. I think the other thing that it's, is different as CEO, you know, as opposed to not the CEO, is um, I have more doubt. You know, I mean, at, at Marketo, I mean, I, I had a lot of confidence and trust in Phil. He was an amazing CEO. Um, and, and that trust, in, you know, in Phil, I could almost sort of like, you know, it, it felt like, okay, it's going to be all right. You know, Phil, you know, Phil knows what he's doing, and, and he, you know, he'll, he'll guide us to success, which he did. Mm -hmm. You know, here at Engageo, it's, you know, it's me, mm -hmm. right? And that doubt that you always hear CEOs have is, is, is there, of course, mm -hmm. um, and that because there is nowhere else for that to go. Yeah. I, I will say, 
uh, you know, I think one of my strengths and weaknesses is that I am a pretty confident person. Like, I've sort of always had that, a lot of self-confidence. Uh, it turns out, I think that's probably one of the most important things you need to have as a, as a founding CEO, because that doubt is so there all the time. If you're not confident, it's just gonna chew you apart, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think, I can't see anybody, but I suspect there's a lot of, I was going to ask for a show of hands, but I suspect there's a lot of aspiring CEOs in the room who are not CEOs today, and that's where you were at Marketo. What advice would you give for people in the room that would like to be a CEO someday, they're not today? What should they be learning today in their current role to put themselves in a position to yep. become a CEO? What, what do you wish you had even learned more of? Well, on, you know, on the skill side, the two things you always hear is product skills and sales skills. Uh, you know, and I think on the margin, uh, as a founding CEO, there, you know, the the product skills are are really important. I mean, just because at the end of the day, you know, you, if you're a technologist or if you're on the business side, you gotta be able to figure out a product that's gonna have product market fit. So, what anything you can do there, I think, is important. I didn't have any sales skills before doing this. Um, or I had never done sales before. Uh, but I think as the CEO, you're just always going to be a good salesperson, you know, even if you don't actually have any formal sales training. So anyway, I think that's one. I think number two is, you know, everybody here is already doing this. Learn everything you can about SaaS companies. You know, kind of just those ratios and those metrics and how they work and how they grow. Uh, well, assuming you want to start a SaaS company. Uh, but I think learn that. And then the third, I think, is the most important is start thinking about your team now, you know, long before you've ever started. Um, you know, when I left Marketo, I didn't, I mean, I left on very friendly terms, and I didn't go hire a whole bunch of people out of Marketo, but I did have my wish list of the four people. I was like, oh, I would love to have those people come, come join and engage you at the right time. And over the last two years, I've managed to actually bring those four people over. Uh, and it's great because you know it's so hard. You know, building your team is probably one of the hardest things uh, as an executive. And if you kind of can have those people identified and nurture those relationships along the way, it makes everything a lot easier. So um, when he, he alluded to this with the picture of his kids, but when he founded Marketo and I invested, we didn't have kids yet, or we were just having kids. Now we've got kids, and you've got two kids, and obviously all the busy life that comes along with that. How are you managing work-life balance the second time around? Is it different? Yeah, one of my theories is always that you know people are going to work. People have like a set point for how hard they work, you know. And and you know I do kind of have my envelope of you know where how much I work and don't work. Um, I think the the you know my co-founder at Engageo also has kids, and so you know we definitely we don't have a culture of people working till eight or nine o'clock at night. Uh, you know, but we, and, but, but we have a work a culture of when you're in the office, you work kind of intensely, which is kind of what you tend to see from people, you know, parents, especially parents with young kids. Um, I wish I had more time to work out. I'm trying, you know, but that, that, that's, that, that's not as much from being an entrepreneur, that's from being a parent. It's really hard to, uh, yep. to do both at the same time. Uh, and I do take PTO. I think that's the other thing that is um, probably even more than else. When you have family, you, you go on trips with your, you know, uh, longer trips than I ever did kind of when, when, when I wasn't a parent. Uh, and I've had to sort of, you know, find ways to be able to actually take time out of the office, uh, you know, and keep things going. And by the way, I think that's role modeling something nice for the company that I do want people to be able to take breaks and then come back. Got it. Um, you mentioned fundraising, obviously very different strategy this time. Part of that's your success. Part of that's the environment, I think. Um, but you didn't talk about choosing investors, constructing a board. Uh, you've done that two different times now with some overlap, but some new investors. What, what advice would you give to folks in the room about constructing a board and an investor base? Sure. Well, you know, as you know, I wish we were able to work with you this time. You know, and and uh, I'm glad you're a personal investor, but, but we haven't been able to make it work formally. Uh, I, I think the most important thing is, is trust. I mean, that's, again, mom and apple pie to say, but you know, I had I had luxury of being able to look at a lot of different firms, uh, especially on on across my rounds, and uh, in, inevitably, what I chose each time was people I know and trust, uh, even if it's not the best terms, the best valuation, 
Because the reality is, these are the people besides my wife who are going to have the biggest impact on my happiness over the next few years. I really wanted to know I had people I trust. In terms of board composition, you know, I'm not like super like, oh, I need somebody exactly like this, but I tend to think about four roles of what I want from my board members. You know, there's, there's the strategist, you know, who's going to help really guide me on like the big issues and make me think about things that I'm not going to think about. There's the operator, you know, who has been there, done it, uh, knows, you know, okay, you should do this, you should do this, have you considered this, you know, kind of technical. There is the networker, right, the person who just knows everybody and can make introductions and, you know, get us into accounts and help me hire and all that kind of thing. Uh, and then there's, I guess, what I would call the fundraising specialist, you know, somebody who just knows the investment industry really well and can kind of guide on strategy, fundraising strategy and tactics and things like that. Obviously, some investors, you know, like you, can fill more of one of those categories. But I do try to think about, all right, how do I get all of those different pieces filled? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. I think we're just about out of time. Uh, John, thank you. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on everything you're doing. Good luck at Engageo. And uh, round of applause for John. Thank you, Doug. Yeah.